Hello, my name is Kevin Tracy, and Zach Manchester and I come from the Robotic Exploration Lab at Stanford University. Today, I'm going to talk about model predictive attitude control for flexible spacecraft during thruster firings. Here is a NASA concept for a deep space asteroid redirect mission. Here is the Maxar 1300 satellite bus, one of the most common in geostationary orbit. And here is the JPL SMAP spacecraft with an unfurlable antenna. The reality is that most spacecraft look like the three I've just shown you. They're flexible, with flexibility coming from either the solar rays, flexible appendages, or payload components. On the contrary, here are NASA's Spitzer and Kepler space telescopes. These spacecraft demand very high pointing performance and are consequently significantly more rigid than the larger spacecraft I've shown you. So why is this? Because spacecraft design is very much a balancing act. Increases in pointing performance often come at a penalty of cost, power availability, and mass. So our question is, can flexible spacecraft be controlled with the same sort of pointing performance as the rigid ones? Because if so, we can make spacecraft lighter and cheaper, as well as enabling new mission designs that weren't possible with previous pointing performance. The flexible behavior of a spacecraft is often excited during fast maneuvers or in the presence of strong external disturbance torques and forces. Now this won't happen with a solar radiation pressure torque or a gravity gradient torque, but it will certainly happen in the presence of a chemical thruster firing. These thruster firings can perturb all the flexible appendages and excite all the structural modes. There are three commonly studied methods for controlling these flexible spacecraft. The first is to actively filter the sensor measurements with some prior knowledge of what the flexible characteristics of the spacecraft are. The second is to actively damp out any flexible behavior after the thruster firing with more thruster input shaping. And the third and most common is there is a whole slew of nonlinear feedback controllers that all leverage an understanding of the flexible behavior and work to control the effects. So our research objective is to develop a fast, online-capable attitude controller that explicitly handles the true flexible behavior, it can plan for thruster firings, and it will always respect the actuator constraints of the system. So for our control development cycle, it went something like this. First, we derived the true equations of motion of the spacecraft with the flexible appendages. Then, we linearized these dynamics. And then, we formulated this optimal control problem as a convex optimization problem. So as far as flexible dynamics choices goes, there are multiple different methods to approximate the flexible behavior. The first is to model your spacecraft as a series of connected rigid bodies. This is the easiest to derive and simulate, and it works well for certain architectures. And we're going to put this somewhere in the ballpark of what we're going to call medium computational complexity. The second is the connected flexible bodies. And this is where you build the spacecraft up with flexible beams and plates. The downside is that this is very difficult to derive, and so we're going to classify this as high computational complexity. And this is both for the difficulty in derivation as well as the ex computational expense of each function call. And the last method is the hybrid coordinate model. And this is where you use some finite element analysis of the spacecraft to determine the flexibility characteristics. Derivation is pretty straightforward, and this method is very common in industry. And we're going to place this at low computational complexity. The hybrid coordinate model was the one selected for this study. Now for the hybrid coordinate model workflow, the first thing that's done is the spacecraft is built in CAD with all the proper materials and joints. Now the reason this is an okay assumption is because for most spacecraft designers, this is already done to account for the mass or thermal properties. The next is a finite element analysis is run on the spacecraft to determine the flexible characteristics. These flexible characteristics are then converted to some sort of flexible mode frequencies and mode shapes, and these are represented in model parameters. So now we're going to look at the hybrid quarter model equations of motion. So first, we're used to seeing these rigid properties in the gyrostat equation. This is J, the inertia matrix, B, the reaction wheel Jacobian, and then disturbance torques and forces. Now for the flexible properties, we now introduce an eta. Now this eta is the modal coordinate displacement, and it shows up in a linear elasticity model. And so here we have C and K, which are our classic damping and stiffness matrices, G, our angular momentum coupling matrix, and phi, our linear momentum coupling matrix. Now what this tells you is how much of the modal coordinate excitation translates to angular and linear momentum. Here are the true nonlinear equations of motion for the hybrid coordinate model. So let's break this down piece by piece. So first, in green, we'll see what we should recognize as the gyrostat equation. Now we see everything that was not captured in the gyrostat model as flexible behavior that shows up. And here on the bottom, we see our linear elasticity model for the modal coordinates. It's also important to note that this equation has a nonlinearity present. Now this is the cross product of the angular velocity with the angular momentum of the spacecraft. For the attitude kinematics, the attitude was parameterized with a modified Rodriguez parameter, or an MRP, and this represented the rotation from the Earth-centered inertial frame to a spacecraft body frame. 
Now, these are a little difficult to simulate with because they have a singularity at 360 degrees, but this won't be an issue for stationary pointing, and so it won't be considered. The next thing is that it's also pretty straightforward to linearize, since there is no unit norm constraint like we have with the quaternion. And here we can see the nonlinear attitude kinematics. For the linearization, we now have a new state, which is the MRP, the angular velocity, and then the modal coordinate displacement and velocities. And now we're going to approximate the dynamics with the first order Taylor series. So in order to do this, we must choose a linearization point. So here we're going to linearize about a spacecraft at rest with no pointing error and no angular velocity. So what this means is that the linearization state is going to be entirely zeros. So now we take our classic A and B Jacobians, and these are the Jacobians of the state derivative with respect to state and the state derivative with respect to control input. We can then approximate our dynamics in a linear affine model. And that is, our state derivative is approximate to a times x plus b times u plus an affine term d. Now this is a function of tau and f, our disturbance torques and accelerations. And the reason this is affine is because these terms do not show up as a function of either x or u. For model predictive control, we will now use our linearized dynamics to formulate a convex optimal control problem. This convex control problem will be solved at every time step, and only the first control in the new plan will be executed. Then, they'll measure a new estimated state, and we will reinitialize the optimization problem and solve again during the next time step. To view this graphically, here we have in red the flight computer. The first thing we do is we start in the top left. We numerically solve this optimal control problem over a finite time horizon. Then, we execute the first control in the plan. We then simulate forward with the true plant dynamics. Then we read in our sensors and we determine our state from our sensor measurements. We now reset the optimization problem with a new set of initial conditions and shift everything down an index. We then solve this again. We will now look at our convex optimization formulation for this optimal control problem. Here we can see that we are optimizing over all both the states and the controls. The first thing to look at is our terminal cost. And this is the cost function that specifically addresses the last state. And this is our terminal cost, and this is going to be convex. Then we'll look at our stage cost. Now this is also convex, and this applies to every single state and control pair in this series for an n-step horizon problem. Now since we're solving for both the states and the controls, we need to ensure that the result is dynamically feasible. And we do this with our dynamics constraints. And the last thing to consider is the constraints of our actuator. So in this case, our actuator are the reaction wheel torques. We have an upper and lower limit of what these wheels can provide. Now the convex solver that was chosen for this problem was the Operator Splitting Quadratic Program Solver, or OSQP. Now this is an ADMM based first order method that's great for solving convex only quadratic programs. This interfaces very well with MATLAB, Python, CVXPy, C, C++, and it's open source and it's very easily adapted for use on an embedded system. This solver is highly tunable and there's a great warm start capability. And what this means is that I can solve this MPC problem once and at the next iteration, I can use the previous solution to get myself partway to a new solution. Now for the simulation setup, we used our MPC formulation and we compared it against an LQR feedback law. We used the same linear system that we use in the MPC for the LQR feedback law as well. A thruster was fired at seven and a half seconds and this contributed a disturbance torque and acceleration to our system. And this simulation used the true nonlinear dynamics and it closed the loop with both the MPC and LQR controllers for comparison. So the first thing we can look at is the pointing error of these two systems. So as you can see, with MPC in black and LQR in dash, that the LQR system saw a significantly higher pointing error. The MPC system was always below about 4 degrees, and the LQR system exceeded 12 degrees. Now the next thing to look at is the slew rate. Most payload components are going to be sensitive to both a pointing error and a maximum slew rate. Here we can see that, once again, MPC significantly outperforms the LQR controller in slew rate. The next thing we can look at is the control usage. These three channels correspond to the three reaction wheels and the torques that were applied to them. As we see, the MPC controller used significantly less control effort than the LQR controller. It's also worth noting that in the case of the third channel of the control input, that the LQR system had trouble dealing with damping of the final mode and the MPC system was able to better understand the true dynamics and leverage them to dampen the mode out entirely. And the last thing to look at from the simulation are the modal coordinates. These are the three coordinates that correspond to the three included modes, and it shows a comparison of LQR and MPC. As you can see, MPC saw better performance in the modal coordinates as well. Now since we're solving this optimization problem at every single time step, it's important that we can solve it quickly. In the case of this simulation, this had to be solved at 2 Hz at a minimum. We were able to solve this problem in less than 1 millisecond. 
In the very beginning, before warm starting was very effective, we saw a maximum of about 1.7 milliseconds. After warm starting was more effective, and after about 50 or 60 seconds, we saw that this solve time reduced to less than half a millisecond. We've now seen that in the absence of model uncertainty, MPC dramatically outperforms LQR. Now the robustness of this solution must be tested since model uncertainty is very likely with the flexible behavior. And this is because CAD models aren't always perfect and on the ground testing for flexible components is very difficult. So what we did was we ran a Monte Carlo with 1000 trials where we applied errors to all the flexible model parameters. These errors were all multiplicative Gaussian errors and they were applied to the damping ratio, the natural frequencies, and then we did both scaling and rotation of the angular and linear coupling matrices. Here we can see a three sigma plot for the pointing error. So what we mean by this is that the upper and lower bounds indicate the plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean performance. The MPC solution beats LQR in every single trial. The next thing to look at is the root mean square pointing error. Again, we can see the MPC does a significantly better job at keeping the pointing error down than LQR. In fact, it did so well that through the 1000 trials, there was not a single one where the LQR did better than the MPC. The next thing to look at is the maximum pointing error. This is important because many attitude control requirements list a maximum allowable pointing error for the payload. Again, we can see that MPC does a much better job at controlling this than LQR. MPC is always in the ballpark between two and four degrees, and LQR often sees between eight and 10 degrees of pointing error. In this study, we controlled a flexible spacecraft during a thruster firing with a model predictive control solution. The optimization problem that we formulated was convex and was solved with a generic quadratic program solver. The solver that we used, OSQP, is open source and can be run easily on embedded systems with sub-millisecond timing. This method was shown to be both robust and high performing when compared to LQR feedback control. With this advancement, we can enable lighter and cheaper spacecraft with better pointing performance.